Welcome back, Camden Catholic, or should I say, good morning, Camden Catholic. As you can see, it's still dark outside. It's about 6.45 in the morning. Mm. Been in school now for about 15 minutes, and we're just going to go ahead and bang this bad boy out, all right? Because our goal in class today was to talk about uh, Senatus Populus Romanum, right? The Senate and the people of Rome. We talked about the patricians, or excuse me, we're going to talk about. Uh, we talked about the patricians, the plebeians, their roles in society, the struggle of the orders, the circus maximus, like, bah, like all that stuff, right? Now, you get your notes now have nice little pretty fancy charts and stuff in them, which makes me extremely happy. But anyway, now we got to talk about stuff that I know people like Dom Stefano is going to be happy to be like listening to. Uh, people that I know like um, uh, Nigel Vedro is going to be excited about listening to. Uh, and some of my other kids who are really, really into like just the conquest side of things, right? So we're getting into today now the Roman model for conquest, right? So really quick, whenever we think of Rome, let's back it up a little bit. Whenever we think of Rome, whenever anybody thinks of Rome, they think of this Rome. Right? They think of the Rome by 117 AD that was so flipping big that anybody could barely even stand it anymore, right? So, absolutely humongous, ridiculously large. So, the thing about getting to that point, you got to get to that point, right? So, the, what we're going to do is we're going to start off by talking. We've already talked a little bit about their conquest. We talked about how by like uh, around 500 AD or BC, they were making moves to like take over the entirety of Italy, right? Going tribe by tribe. Because remember, the Romans were a group of people that shot off the Latins and then they took over the Latins and then they took over the Etruscans and then they took over the Aqua or the Aquai or whoever Cincinnati took over, you know, those guys. So, anyway, let's keep going though. All right. Now, the goal. Of Roman conquest, divide, explore, conquer, right? Now, to keep in mind real, real quick, whenever you're looking at this map, a lot of people are always like, oh my god, how could they possibly take over an area that big? It's so huge, that's got to be millions of people. What is millions of people? That's very, very accurate. But the thing about it is, there's not a lot of stuff out here yet, all right? So none of Europe is developed. It's very rural, agrarian still. Some places even nomadic, right? Barbarians running around, farming, doing very simple things. North Africa is developed by one particular city-state. Greece is developed, but of course, like, that's falling apart because this is like around the uh, Hellenistic period uh, when everything's kind of coming down and crashing in on itself because Alexander the Great did not leave it to very good leaders, right? But the thing about it is, is it, what, what I'm saying is it wasn't as hard following a big rivalry that they actually had, right? So the Romans did not plan to grow as large as they did. They actually had no intention. They had no intention to get to that extreme size. But they just kept taking over area after area to add to the empire. Like slowly they would be like, oh, well, there's a group out there called the Visigoths. We'll go take their stuff. Oh, well, there's a group out there called the uh, the Magyars. We'll take their stuff. Oh, well, there's a um, blah, 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 blah. They just saw economic gain. And it was a very slow process. From about 500 AD to 117 AD, they were just growing and growing and growing and growing, right? So that's, what's the math on that? 617 years it took them to get to that? That's a lot. That's almost three times as long as America's even been a country. Mm. Now, to keep going, though, the big kind of match that lit the fire, Paul McInerney brought this up in class the other day because he's a stud, right? So it's called the Punic Wars, right? So by 272 BC, all of the peninsula is under the control of Rome, and a rivalry has developed between Rome and one particular city-state. A city state originally settled by the Phoenicians, actually, in northern Africa, right? Somebody and right now is probably like hollering in the background, somebody like, I don't know, like tall David, or even David Kuhn as well, right? So David Liu and David Kuhn are like, but I thought you said that the Phoenicians never settled anywhere. Well, the thing about it is they did have trade port cities. They had different areas where they would actually establish like small settlements, right? So, but that one of those small settlements grew and grew and grew in North Africa into a place called Carthage, right? So over who, uh, excuse me, the reason why this beef started is because it's over who's going to control sea trade in the Western Mediterranean. It's all about money. It's all about money. And here's the craziest part about this entire war. 
if you really, really look at it, Carthage, this is what we believe it looked like when it was actually at its height. Look how gorgeous that was. I'm not even going to lie to you. Looking at this, I think I would have chosen Carthage over Rome any day. Look, they had actually like rotating ship locks, an entire like sea trade infrastructure. It's what they were best known for. They were founded by the Phoenicians, right? They're all about trade and society. They had very Greek and Romanesque architecture that was already built up. Or imagine for a moment that they united together and then were just like this dominant powerhouse. Maybe they never would have fallen. Maybe Rome would have never fallen if they would have made friends instead of enemies. Hmm. But yeah, that's Carthage in North Africa. Uh, ooh, what country is Carthage? Uh, what's Carthage in current day? I believe this is either Libya or Algeria right here. So I think it's Algeria. Um, or actually, Tunisia maybe? Hold on. I gotta look that up. I gotta look it up. I gotta look it up. I gotta look it up. Um, North Africa map. Yep, Tunisia. All right, so uh, I was close and off twice. But like, anyway, it's hard when there ain't no lines. But yeah, the original Carthage was in modern-day Tunisia. T-U-N-I-S-I-A. You're getting your next map tomorrow. <laughs> so anyway, but let's keep going. So actually, your next map will include parts of northern Africa. It's going to be like the areas of which Rome took over, right? So there we go. And Carthage is here in purple, so they actually owned a lot of this stuff. And then by this point in uh, 264 BC, this rivalry had begun to grow. Now, it keeps getting worse whenever the Romans take over places like Corsica and Sardinia, and then they also go into the south of Spain and the Andalusians and like places like that, right? And on the Iberian Peninsula. So, the first battles start over the Isle of Sicily, though, okay? So, the first war, the Roman navy is going to take control over the Isle of Sicily. It's not... <laughs> Did anyone really win the first war? Not really. The Romans kind of just came in. They were like, we want Sicily. And the Carthaginians were like, all right. Like, I mean, like, and they just kind of withdrew their ships. There was never really an official declaration. There was never really an official, like, battle schematic or anything like that. They just kind of, like, fell in on itself. And the first war was just kind of resulted in the Rome building up its navy and taking over Sicily, right? So now, really, really quick, why Sicily, though? Why? Anybody want to guess, like, why Sicily in particular? I hear Margaret Incel, like, thinking really, really hard about this right now. But I also hear, very, very nice, extremely impressive. I hear y'all back there. Michael Alvarez and Miss Incel are completely correct. Remember, the Greeks had settled Sicily and colonized that area a long time before that the Romans had ever even been there. And there goes my brand new phone that I probably just broke. Um, so, yep, yep. Um, now, anyway. Anyway. Uh, the, they had actually settled that area due to its natural harbors, right? So if Rome's building up this naval fleet, they have to have somewhere to put it at port, right? So they actually took over Sicily. But then this is going to anger two men in particular, Hamilcar and Hannibal, right? So Hamilcar, father of Hannibal, to Carthaginian generals, right? They're not Romans, they're Carthaginian. So the Second Punic War, Rome is going to be threatened when Hannibal actually takes his army, some on elephants, to the city of Rome, right? Well, here's the thing. Let's back it up real quick, right? So Hamilcar was in during the First Punic War when Rome is just going to take over Sicily and it's not really going to gain any ground and, like, there wasn't even really, like... Because there were, like, parts of Sicily that the Carthaginians still owned, so it was just more like a recession of territory. But Hamilcar was furious. He was mad that the Carthaginians weren't more aggressive. He was mad that they didn't do more to stop the Roman growth. And so he just develops a seething hatred for Rome, right? And so he takes his son, Hannibal, here, and he slaughters a goat, lays it down, tells him to put his hand on it and swear to forever hate Rome and to one day try to destroy them. And Hannibal took it seriously. And he was like, all right, Pop, I swear, right? And then he ends up building an army for the Second Punic War because they're going to be threatened by Hannibal's army when he amasses troops and elephants, and all of these other devices ready to go and destroy Rome. A lot of historians say had Hannibal had a direct line to get to Rome, he probably would have sacked it again, at the like most recent sack since the Gauls, right? So the thing about it is, if you look, remember, somebody tell me really quick, please, someone remember, why is it so hard to attack Rome from its coastline? 
<laughs> Jocelyn, I heard you over there. That is impressive. That is exactly right. It's all cliffs, right? It's all edged off cliffs, okay? So Italy is just a line of cliffs right next to their oceans. So the, uh, the Carthaginians couldn't actually just go and invade from the coastline. They had to instead do this. Uh, where am I going? Where am I going? There we go. They had to instead do this. They had to leave Carthage, go all the way around Rome, all the way around the north, over top of the Alps, and then come down to Rome from above. Now, the thing about that is, is in that process, a lot of those elephants are going to die. A lot of your soldiers are going to freeze to death. A lot of these different, like, you're going to lose a lot of reserves and a lot of men in the process of just getting to Rome, right? And just getting there. And so, continuing forward, though, while that's going on, there's a North Af or there is a Roman general, right? I imagine that he probably looked something like, like, I don't know, like Jeremiah, but with a helmet. All right, anyway, now, and he was like, what's up? If he's coming to attack us with his entire military, why don't I just go attack his house because it's undefended, right? So, bang, and that's exactly what Scipio, the Roman general, did. He leaves Rome with an entire military, hops off to Sicily, hops over to Carthage, and wrecks Carthage and attacks the lands in North Africa, making Hannibal turn around and come all the way back to try and stop him, right? So, anyway, Hannibal was forced to return to Africa to defend Carthage's lands. However, Carthage is going to give up the Second Punic War and lose in 202 BC. So much for swearing on that goat there, Hannibal. Now, after the Third Punic War in 146 BC, which is a very short war, Carthage is going to be left in ruins, all right? A lot of the Carthaginians would be actually abducted and sold into slavery. Hmm. And we're not going to stop there, all right? So then, oh, uh, so the ruins of Carthage that are left behind show pretty much total and utter destruction that we have, historically speaking, right? There is an old story that goes that the Romans wanted to destroy their entire city so badly that they couldn't use it. But then one general stood up and was like, well, wait, sir, this land is fertile, right? This land is fantastic. How do we keep them from ever being able to use it again? The legend goes that the Romans then also salted the lands, like actually laid salt all over the land so the Carthaginians could not actually even grow anything anymore, right? So anyway... Greece, Macedonia, and parts, parts of Southwest Asia are also going to come under Roman control using diplomacy and threats during the Punic Wars. Just like Philip II of Macedonia. Did they have to fight every single battle? to Everything in red that was on that map, did they have to fight for it? Not necessarily, right? So threats is just basically telling somebody, either give up now or we're going to invade. And diplomacy is along the lines of, if you allow us to come in and put in a government and things like that, we'll officially protect you. Uh -huh, right? So diplomacy and a threat, two very different things. Okay? Diplomacy is providing protection in a lot of ways, especially if you're Rome at this point. Well, modern-day diplomacy is peace treaties, trade agreements, a lot of other stuff. Right? So whereas threats are actually much more along the lines of like threatening violence. Now, there's one more story I need somebody to remind me of. All right? So Tamara, I need somebody to remind me of a story of what happened to one of the Carthaginian governors whenever the Romans showed up and destroyed the Roman lands, or the Carthaginian lands. I don't want to tell the story on the internet. It's just not, not something I want to throw out there. But anyway, just remind me in class tomorrow, right? Don't let me forget. Now, the Roman Republic is going to be divided into provinces, and a governor is going to be appointed to rule each one, right? We started talking about that already when we started talking about them taking over different parts of Italy, okay? So the people of the new provinces had to pay taxes, to Rome, and some were also even taken to slavery. Very, 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 very few of these city-states and these conquered territories were going to be allowed to become citizens, but it did eventually happen. Because a lot of wealthy Romans, those patricians, are going to begin to move out into the countryside and into these newly conquered lands and create these things called villas, right? So anyway, now, but we'll talk about how that affected Europe a little bit later on. But by 117 AD, that's everything they owned, right? It's absolutely ridiculous. Now, so we're going to stop there, okay? And then tomorrow in class, we're going to talk about the Gracchi brothers, right? Tiberius and Gaius, right? I'm going to name my firstborn children after those guys. Now, anyway, so we'll talk about them tomorrow, but that's it. That's the Punic Wars and Roman conquests, right? But tomorrow we're going to talk about, like, land reform and how that affected the veterans and the people of Rome, okay? Really, really enjoyed it. Hope you all did, too. I will see you guys tomorrow. Have a great evening.